Good morning. morning. You all can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Aaron Thompson. He's a senior vice president for academic affairs at the Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education. Please join me in, in welcome, welcoming Dr. Aaron Thompson. Thank you, Dr. Scheffel. A lot of pleasure being here this morning, huh? <laughs> We just had a great exercise, and I'm looking forward to pointing out a few teaching things. First of all, what did you notice about this exercise? Tell me some things that a good teacher would notice. Uh, what, what, get, get, didn't get, you, you see how he quickly starts blaming the teacher? You notice that? Yeah. yeah. What was the ground? What what was not enough ground rules? What were you confused on? Ah, so is education purely about being efficient? When you're getting students engaged, do you hand them something to give back to you? Or do you get engaged with them to learn it? Absolutely. What else? It's a great community building project. That was a good thing. But what else you notice? And we'll get to the community building in a second. What else did you notice about it? How many of you? Yes. Everybody liked different things, no doubt about it. Yes. Ah, it was hard for them to move out of their safe space, right? Uh, how many of you listened to the instructions? How many came up and asked me several times after I said specifically what not to do? Think about it for a second. Now, this is part of the exercise just to show you that even, even when you think that you've explained yourself well, there's going to be people that will interpret that you didn't give them enough, there's going to be people that really are not listening to you because they're already engaged in something else in their minds. Am I right? And there's going to be people that will automatically jump to the conclusion because we've kind of taught that. What else did you notice? How many of you found it hard? I mean, how many of you went for the easy things first? How many, were any of these hard to ask someone? No, I, I started to make it harder. I, normally when I do this, I make it a lot harder, but I gave you all a break today. So how many of you stayed with your own friends and assumed you knew the answer? Anybody? How many of you assumed you knew the answer to something already? Or how many assumed that you knew that person well enough that you kind of knew what the answer was going to be? No? You, thank you, sir. Yes. That's right. So you didn't think you had to verify, right? This is what happens fairly often when we think people are like us or that we already know the answer. Even when something is in front of our face, I'm from southeastern Kentucky, even when we think something is in front of our face, if we don't go deep, what does it say about us? We always find out something interesting and new, right? This also showed, also showed that we're a diverse group of people, even if we think we look alike, correct? OK. How many of you have 20? It has to be right. How many have 21? 22? 23? 24? 25? 26, 27, 28, 29, wow, 30, 31, is there 31? Anybody beat 32? It has to be correct. Okay, stand up. 
By the way, if you notice also, people wanted to win at all costs, right? They wanted to start early and they wanted to end late. I want to win at all costs. Okay, if you miss one, then you know you miserably fail, right? By the way, let's see if, in fact, he's going to win this wonderful book. What's your name, sir? Where are you from, Sean? Okay, tell us about it. Read off one by one. Will, where are you? Do you? Who are they? Where at? Okay. Okay. Daniel, is that correct? Yeah. Which one is it? The old one. The old one? Yeah. Okay, that still counts. <laughs> Wes comes from a family of three or more children. Wes? Is that correct? What are their names? Maybe, maybe Jennifer and Sarah. Really? Sarah with an A or an H? Yeah. That's okay. My daughter's with an A. You're still okay. Brandon, do you? I don't know where you got that. No. <laughs> I was going to say, you sure don't look like it, man. <laughs> no, you do, actually. Do you? What kind of exercising do you do? Boy, it's warm in here, isn't it? Really? You hope to look like me one of these days? <laughs> yes. Uh, Sherry, where are you? Sherry. Do you? Yes. Too much MSD. I love it too, but blood pressure. What kind of Chinese food do you like? I like orange chicken. Orange chicken? Oh, God, you even, really, that stuff is really bad for you. I like it too, though. Yeah. Uh, Sarah has experience in stereotypes. Sarah? Where are you? You have? What kind of stereotype? Okay. Did it bother you? Cool. No, not cool. But yeah, I hear you. Who? Cartner. Where at? Oh, cool. Not a bad place, is it? Yeah. Starla has a friend or relative Starla? Who is it? Okay. Ashley, are you kind of messed up because of it? No? <laughs> okay. uh, Laura, loves dance. Laura, where are you? Bye. Come up here, let's see what you got. <laughs> really? What kind of dancing do you do? I mean, I just like to dance. You like to dance? Is it like really good dancing or that dancing you think is good when it really isn't? Okay, but you love it, right? That's what matters, right? That's what matters. Uh, Ashley P. You have a purple shirt on. Ashley P. Do you like purple? Yeah. Really? You know, it's, I could say it's obvious, but nothing's ever obvious to me, and I'm a sociologist. Uh, Rachel, owns a cat. Rachel, where are you? Right. You have a cat. Well, which one are you talking about? This matters. Okay, Rachel, what's your cat's name? Um, I just got it on Monday. Really? So you haven't bonded to it? No, it's a little bit. A little bit of kitten? Yeah. They scare me. <laughs> I can handle big dogs, but not little kittens. Uh, Annette plays an instrument. Annette, where are you? What kind of instrument? I play violin. Oh, really? Are you good? I have absolutely no musical talent, but I'll, I hate people that do, because it, I mean, really, think about it, they're smart, they can do all kinds of wonderful things with it, I'm impressed. Yes? Uh, Amy M is left-handed. Amy? <laughs> Did you know about left-handed people? Did you know that 20% of all the leaders are left-handed? and only what portion of the population is left-handed, very small. And they said left-handed people are smarter than other folks, but I'm here to prove it otherwise. <laughs> now. Jake has blue eyes. 
Jake? Is that correct? Come up here, let me look at him. No, you don't have to. Yes? Ashley, you can't use the same person twice. That Ashley, what, what's your dog's name? Jackson and Bella. Jackson and Bella. What kind of dogs are they? Wiener dogs. Wiener dogs? Cool. Uh, Claire has dated someone of another race. Claire, where are you? I hope he was cool. He was okay. Claire, anybody that dates you, they should be cool. If they're not cool, don't deal with them. You know what I'm saying? No matter what kind of race they are. <laughs> yes. Do what? Teaching? I'm assuming that's the guy with the beard. No, I'm joking. That's a joke. <laughs> what was your first choice? <laughs> oh, really? So you're sitting next to her. What made you decide to teach? Uh, get a job. There you go. Fair enough. <laughs> Teaching wasn't mine either, by the way. I was in business for 10 years. Can you believe that? Corporate business. Uh, Kristen is a shopaholic. Kristen? Are you? Yeah. What do you buy? Everything. Really? <laughs> I hate shopping. Would you shop for me? Yeah, I would love to. OK, we'll talk. <laughs> I, I, you know, I seriously, I like making money, but I don't really, I don't care to spend it. I just don't want to like go through the hassle of doing it. That's why I love shopping on the internet. But then I hate to open the boxes. So. Uh, T.Y. does not enjoy uh, being around clowns. Who? T.Y. You don't like clowns? Uh, not particularly. I'm glad you don't know <laughs> 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 We must date the same girl. I had a couple of those, too, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't like them if they're dressed up or not, all right? I hear you. Clowns are weird, though. I mean, that's, I'm there with you, man. Especially if they're your ex-girlfriend. Yes. Uh, Ashley, Ashley, where are you? Oh, I do, too. You should see my feet, girl. Ooh, ugly. <laughs> they don't stink, but they're ugly. Uh, ben was raised by a single parent. Ben? Where are you? Mom or dad? Cool, right? They can do it well. Look at you. So don't ever let people get bogged down that a single mother or a father can't kick butt. Yeah. Uh, David has a best friend of another race. David? Is that correct? Yeah. It's not me, is it? No, his name's RJ. He's from uh, Cool. Uh, Mary Elizabeth is a vegetarian. Mary Elizabeth, where are you? What kind of meat you like with that? Uh, no meat. That's a bad word, isn't it? What's your favorite kind of vegetarian meal? Uh, I really like spicy. So do I. You're making me hungry. Uh, Kayla belongs, or belongs to a Greek organization. Who? Kayla. Kayla? Which one is it? Um, I and Anthony and Kappa Alpha Kayla. Is it a cool organization? No, it's pretty cool. No, y'all hate each <laughs> other, don't you? You love each other? I'm sure you do. Uh, Brittany plans to pursue a career in school administration. Brittany, where are you? Do you? Yeah. Up through like the principalship and superintendents and all that kind of stuff? I'm not the district. I'm a city principal. You know what? I'm glad. We need, we need great leaders. Leaders matter. Let's meet the two Yeah, leaders matter. Uh, Bridget, Bridget, do you? What is it? Pirate. Pirate? With like one patch over the eye kind of thing? <laughs> Jason? You did? did. From where? BCTC. BCTC. What we used to call LCC. Yep. Yeah. And Jared, Jared follows someone on Twitter. Jared? Who do you follow? Not me? Cool. Uh oh.
He already called on you, didn't he? I was visiting. I apologize. Ah. Her sisters? Oh. What did you scribble under her name or above her name? You're a workaholic? Do you? That's just another way for saying, actually, it's okay for me to kill myself. <laughs> Get it together. I haven't gotten mine together yet, by the way. Cool. Anybody got anything different you want to add? Can you catch? Just start reading? All right. Anybody else? Who had 31? Who had 30? You got anything different you want to add? Like what? What don't you have? Anybody born outside the U.S. in here? Where, where were you born? Persia. Persia. I like uniqueness. Thank you. You're welcome. What else? Anybody have anything else? Yes. Aha, she went outside the box. I like people who go outside the box. She talked to the instructor, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not that. No. We'll do some more as we go along today. Cultural competence is the foundation of establishing, I mean, cultural competence in the classroom establishing the foundation for student learning. For the next little bit, and I'll give you a break here in a few minutes, uh, we already did that. I want you to think about this. Maybe we should turn some lights off. If I turn a little bit off, would you go to sleep? You will? So I won't turn it off. You can't go to sleep. <laughs> I want you to think about this in any sort of term or philosophy or paradigm you want to think about it. This is an element by which we can think about leadership. I'm looking at you, leadership lady. Focus on me. I'm pointing at you, and you're back looking back there. What are you looking back there for? Ah. We can look at it as far as leadership. We can look at it as far as teacher leader. We can look at it as far as individual ways of growth. And I want you to think of it this way. The first stage of any, aware, any process of growing is about being self-aware. So as a teacher, what do you really believe? What are your biases? <coughs> Awareness goes to asking you, what do you really believe? Not what you want to believe, but what do you really believe? Here in a little bit, I'm going to give you a PowerPoint you can take with you, but I know you well enough to know if I give it to you, read it, right? So you can add something. So notes will be on this. The scary thing about what people say they believe, in fact, it's based in many cases not on solid ground. How many of you in this room are a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or some formal political party? Raise your hand. Raise it high. What if I told you that I'm willing to take you on in a debate about your political belief, and I would bet you I would beat you at your game? But we can only talk fact. Not opinion, not conjecture, but fact. How many would be willing to take me on? I knew you were going to raise your hand. Yeah. Why, why is that a question that you should actually think about deeply? People in America say there's two things that they know what they believe in, why they believe in it the most, and that's, what are those two main things? Religion and politics, am I right? Now, if you belong to a political party, have you read the platform of your party? Well, yeah. I'm voting. I'm voting for you. Uh, 
but if you really have a political party, you should know the platform of the party, right? It's not just the guy that showed up on TV for 10 seconds, or it's not just because your mama and daddy was that. If it's your belief, it needs to be your belief. Most belief systems are based in superficial tone and bravado is in the ways that people will jump up and say, this is what I believe and you can't prove me wrong because I believe that, right? And I'm using only politics as an example. Let's say you're a Christian where most people in America say that they are. Then your belief system should be based on what foundation? If you're a Christian. The Bible, right? How often do people say, I don't believe in this because it goes against my religion? And you can challenge people to tell me what is the foundation of that. My point being is that I'm just using religion and politics, but when you say that you're a teacher, what do you really think about kids? What do you really think about the learning of the kids? What's your belief systems about them? Do you believe that if you have if you're in a situation where they can't speak the language as well as you can, that they can learn as well as you? What if you're of color? What if you're a female in the sciences? What if you're all of those things? How do we challenge ourselves to understand our belief systems? Truly, how do we get to the point that we need to be what we need to be? So awareness is the first stage that you have to go through to become a good teacher. I know you think you've gotten all this education about how to do foundations, how to do pedagogy and all that stuff, but you haven't been challenged at this level, I promise you. Think about what you really believe. We call this your IQ. We get bogged down with building our intellectual selves, our knowledge base, because we think we know it all. As a teacher, I promise you, you're going to be challenged where you're going to be challenged on such a regular basis that you'll figure out you don't know it all. It is important that you understand awareness and at what level you need to challenge yourself and challenge your students to be self-aware, right? It's important that you also understand that if you don't set up this foundation, if there's something you don't know, you find it out, right? It's building your IQ, building your knowledge base. Every semester when I walked into the class, the first five minutes of class, you know what I did? I walked in class and I said, what's going on today, folks? What's going on in our world today? How many people in my class said anything the first day? Nobody, because they're not used to being engaged. Because they're used to having the teacher come in and just start talking. So then I start saying, well, you know, I was reading in the newspaper this morning, I saw this, I was, saw it on TV last night on the news, I saw this, I saw this and I saw that and so on. Then I go on with the lecture of the day. The next class period, I come in, what's going on today? And guess what I find out? There will be one or two people that will speak up and say something. Are you texting someone? listening to me, aren't you? You're focused on me. I like to be focused on. It's important that you understand students want to be engaged. Are you good at engaging people? I'll have one or two people that will say, yeah, this is what's going on in America today. The next class period, I have four or five or six or seven. The next, by the time I get to be four or five class periods into the semester, everybody's talking about what's going on. You know what I've accomplished? Did you know that students will stay in school and learn more if they're engaged? How many of you knew that, that engagement is the number one item? Did you know that? Guess what else? They were reading stuff outside of the class that I hadn't assigned and they enjoyed it. Guess what else? They were learning new things and they were happy they were learning new things. I never took role and I always had at least 95% or higher class attendance. And as Dr. Skeppel can tell you, I am not an easy teacher. The idea that as a teacher you need to be aware of how able are you to engage your students in learning. 
How able are you to get them motivated to get stuff? That's building your IQ. The second one is an acknowledgement. Know that as a teacher, whatever you believe will have a direct impact on your students. Whatever you believe will have a direct impact on your students, positive or negative, it will have a direct impact. This is called building your social IQ, social intelligence. Building your social intelligence and knowing that even fellow teachers will. They will either follow you as a knowledge bearer, follow you as a good teacher. They will be challenged by you. In some cases, they won't like you because you make them feel not adequate. But just know your students will for sure. Know who you are and what you're at. Teachers matter. Some of the biggest impacts I had on my life was from a teacher. Miss Ruby Lois Hilbert from... Clay County. Big impact on my life. Still is. It's important that if you have a negative belief about someone and believe they can't learn, guess what those students will do? Not learn. You are the power in your room. You are the power in your room. So acknowledgement is knowing that whatever you believe it filters over to your students. If you believe they can learn, they will learn. If you believe they can't, they won't. If you believe that an African-American student can't learn, a Hispanic student can't learn, a person in ESL can't learn, a person with some other sort of disability can't learn, if you believe that, they will not learn. And guess what we've seen over and over again in research? Once you have high rigor, high expectations, and high involvement and high engagement, guess what happens? They learn. Teachers matter. The third one is acceptance. You are, as a teacher, what you eat. You are what you eat, I tell people. The idea that I may not know exactly, she's gone. Stereotype. I may not, who was that? Oh yeah, no, I, I thought she was in the front row. I may not know what it meant to be her stereotype, but I've been stereotyped against. So if I looked at her and I say, tell me how you felt, and she tells me and I can tell her how I felt, then in fact, we've connected. This is called emotional intelligence. This is called empathy. Students and other people will want to have an emotional intelligence. They need to believe that you know where they're coming from. And you have to take the time and ask them. You don't just give them the paper. You don't give them the 40 questions in math that they got wrong the first time, you checked it off wrong, get them, give them 40 more questions the next time. You take those 40 questions, you go deep with them, and you work with them until they get the first 40 questions right, if you want to teach math. And you have to teach them that math isn't scary. I almost didn't get my PhD because I knew that my degree was going to require a lot of statistics. And I said, well, I can't do math. I had been told I couldn't do math. Even though I did, as I think, well, I got pretty good grades in math. But I was afraid of it. But once I did it, guess what happened? I got it. Guess what was the first job I was hired to do once I got my PhD? That was a long time ago. I'm a statistician. I taught stats for years in the college setting at EKU. Can you believe that? You can do all kinds of things, but you have to be able to know that if you become a teacher, it's more than just saying you're a teacher. You have to accept, accept the fact that you are. And that means teaching for all the people that you're dealing with. Acceptance is emotional intelligence. So if you figure this out, you can't have a good social intelligence or without what? First, doing what? Having a strong knowledge base. You can't have a great emotional intelligence without having what? Social intelligence. But you can't do any of them without an action plan. When you walk out of here today as a teacher that's going to be, I want you to take with you two things that you know you're going to employ in your teaching profession. Don't walk out of here today just feeling like you've had your day taken up by some talking head. I want you to walk out today with the power to know that you're going to have impact. So what are going to be the items you want to do? So action.
Before that is theory. You put it into action, it will work. And as a teacher, this is called a continuous assessment model. As a teacher, if you do all of this, guess what you'll do once you get to that point? You'll keep growing, won't you? Please understand the power that you have as a teacher. How true is that? So where do you go now? How do you develop an action plan? Part of what you need to do is just understand that you've got a lot of the basics that EKU has given you, but you're going to be learning more on the job than you ever learn while you're in school. <coughs> My first year of teaching, I learned more, <laughs> I think, than I did all those millions of years it took for me to get a PhD. It's applying your knowledge. So what is culture? Culture has two different pieces. In your classroom, you have a culture. In your community, you have a culture. But culture is the process of understanding the values and the norms that people are bringing to the table, the things you can't see. As a teacher, you're going to have to, if you've got 23 kids, you're going to have to learn how many cultures? 23. 20, you do. Now, there may be some similarities that you can do some things together, but you do. Just to ever assume that I got, you know, 20 white kids and, and two Hispanic kids and one black kid, that I got tw one culture of 20 kids, you know, uh, one culture of two kids, one culture of one kid is a bad assumption. Each kid's bringing several things to the table. I had the great opportunity of speaking in front of a law school class not too long ago, and it was a very prestigious law school class, and I won't tell you where it was at, but I had a friend of mine, one from New York, one from Washington, D.C., one from uh, Eastern Tennessee, and myself on stage, and I told this third year group of law students, I said, you got a few minutes, you can ask us all any questions, then you, have you heard clickers? Y'all had clickers in school, right? Then I want you to click on and tell me who you think that's most alike and who you think that's most different. And choose two that's most alike, two that's most different. At the end of five minutes, everybody walked off stage but me. I said, go ahead and choose. When they came back, guess I should have told you this, that there were two black folk, me being one of them, if you haven't figured I'm African American, by the way. Why'd you laugh at that? By the way, I have to tell you, I've been African American all my life kind of thing. But uh, several years ago, we, uh, we employed a lot of folks and we started looking at our heritage. And if you know anything about African Americans in this country, it's kind of hard to trace back, you know, because of slavery and a variety of other things that kind of delineated the cultures. But the interesting thing that when we looked, we found out my father's from Clay County, Kentucky, and my mother's from Westville, Alabama. And we found all kinds of things, I'll make a long story short, to find out that my father mainly was more European American than African American. Uh, and if you knew my father, you would see that would be the case. My mother had, was basically half Native American, half American Indian and half African descent. So it ended up being, I only had like, four, you can't measure in percentages, but let me just say, I was only like 40 something percent black. So I've been having an identity crisis ever since. And, uh, but in America, I am African American, right? It's a social definition more than it is a biological definition. It has nothing to do with biology. Did you know that? It's the way that we socially define who you are based on the way you look. But anyway, the idea that I asked this great group of intelligent law students to choose who was the most alike, two African Americans and two white folks, from different communities, guess who they choose being most, chose being most alike? Two African Americans, right? And the two white folks. The most different were across racial lines. When I brought the people back on stage and I said, okay, here's some questions you need to ask. Talk about their culture. Talk about where they're from. Talk about the kind of foods they like. Talk about the, what they did growing up. Talk about the things that they value. Talk about those kinds of questions. They asked those questions and guess what they found out? 
they found out that I was more like the white guy from eastern Tennessee. The black guy from New York was more like the, black guy, uh, the white guy from Washington, D.C. You have to go deeper, am I correct? Culture is talking about more than just what you wear, the material stuff. It talks about asking the kinds of questions to figure out where they're coming from with the things you can't see. Culture is a whole way a group interacts. Now, there are some, there are some commonalities that you should know. How many of you believe there's black culture? Raise your hand. Just one person? No one else? What is it? By the way, you all believe it. You just won't raise your hand because you know I'm challenging you. What is it? Okay. Then if there's black culture, then there's white culture, right? Well, you can't have one without the other. So what's white culture? <laughs> well, it's, it, and it's really not about that. We have stereotypes of what we think black culture is, right? We even have some, well, we don't ever challenge white culture. We just think it's a given. It's the norm. It's the normal, right? But the reality of it all, there is black culture, but it, it's rooted in the history of America. It's rooted in slavery. It's rooted in disenfranchisement. White culture is rooted in privilege. That doesn't mean that every white person is privileged. That's not my point. That doesn't mean every black person is disenfranchised right now. I'm probably doing okay. What it means is that we get bogged down with very superficial ways of trying to put people in boxes instead of going deeper and more completely. And this is especially true once we look at the globalization issue. <laughs> you guys are not laughing at anything today. Some dimensions of cultures you have to deal with in your schools, no doubt about it. You may even have to deal with it in your own life. And it's, by the way, let me say something that you're going to find heresy. It's okay to challenge your religion. It's okay to challenge your parents' thoughts. Because as a good parent, the thing you should have done is to teach your kids how to live in the world they're going to live in and not the world that you lived in. You understand what I mean? That's what a good parent should do. If your parent says, I want you to be better than me, then a good parent will teach you how to be better than them, not how to be just like them. That's just the truth. Doesn't mean you don't love your parents. It means that you're supposed to be, we live in a society that our parents didn't live in, I promise you. And your kids will live in a society that you don't live in. How do we teach them how to be good citizens of that society? So what is diversity? It refers primarily to differences among groups. But those differences together, it goes one step farther, is how do we actually make these differences work for us to the whole of humanity? That's the other part of diversity. It talks about recognizing and appreciating. That's the other piece you have to put to it. It's more than just saying, I know that we're different and that's cool. It's about how do we appreciate those differences and take it to the next level, right? And it is talking about collective achievement. You got in your class a diverse group of people, take advantage of them. Did you know that people learn more from people that are different than them than they do from people that are like them? How many of you know that? How many of you know that in your freshman year of college was the greatest chance you ever had to learn ever in your life? How many knew that? The freshman year of college was the greatest chance you ever had. It's the most time ever in the history of most people that they will experience the most diversity for the first time. And we do a terrible job in our universities to help you to take advantage of that. You learn more outside the classroom, you do inside the classroom, don't you? You join fraternities and sororities, and we try to match up people in our organizations that we think they're like us, so we are not challenged very well. It's kind of what we do. <laughs> but it has to be more than, in the classroom as a teacher, you have to do more than the superficial stuff like hanging turkeys on the wall. You understand what I mean at Thanksgiving? You have to do more than just celebrate Martin Luther King Day. 
You have to do more than just celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. You have to do more than just say, I have a good friend from Persia. Right? You have to do more than that. It's about teaching. It's about pedagogy. It's about using examples from across the world. It's about challenging the students to go beyond that. These are the dimensions, the spectrums of diversity that I think you should look at in your teaching process. And I think you guys are getting a book somewhere sooner or later that helps you to go through this. But it's all of those items. So how do you value it? It's a process of understanding that it's not only a process with us as an individual, but it's also with the students. How do we get students to value diversity? It's called communication. It's called working with them to help them to understand how they can use their own knowledge to gain new knowledge and help other people gain new knowledge. How many of you have been a mentor before? Anybody been a mentor? How many of you have been a mentee or a protege? If every single one of you don't raise your hand, then you're lying. Someone, you didn't get here on your own. Well, maybe one or two of you did, but you didn't. Someone helped you to get here, am I right? Somebody did. Your knowledge base had to be built by somebody. You just didn't grow up and say, oh man, I'm on my own. I'll get all this stuff myself. The greatest, greatest possible thing you can add in life is to mentor someone else. It's the greatest possible thing. And they can look just like you because peers matter. Did you know that? Did you know people about the age of 11 or 12 learn more or listen to their peers more than they listen to a parent or a teacher? How do we get peers as a part of the process? When I was going into high school, I had one brother who went to high school before me, but he was long gone. And I had nobody. The school that I graduated from, the eighth grade in, not a lot of folks even went to high school. When I got to high school, I didn't know these people, and I came from a very interesting background that I won't take up the time today to talk about, but the idea that there was nobody going before me that I understood that I could grab and talk to. But where I grew up, it taught me innovation, and that's what you need to have as a teacher. Know the word innovation. And innovation only means that you know how to take advantage of knowledge when it comes to you, right? It's been entrepreneurial. So when I went to high school, I figured out I was going to find success by understanding who were the smartest kids in high school in my mind. So I found the five smartest kids, and I decided whatever they did, I was going to do. Whatever courses they took, I was going to take, whatever organizations they belong to, I was going to belong to. We call that stalking. You can't do that now. <laughs> but then it was mentoring. Forced mentoring, maybe, but it was mentoring. And I got connected that way. How do you actually put in your classroom ways that kids can connect to other kids to grow with? My mom always said, boy, you hang out with the no goods and you'll be no good. In other words, Peers can be bad, too, if you don't use them to your benefit as a teacher. Am I right? So how do you do that? How do you actually put people together that will help them to do it? Looking at diversity among your students and putting them together, not just diversity among ethnicity, but diversity among thoughts, beliefs, will help that growth process to take place. So this is the thing I want you to remember. Diversity is about a demographic in many cases. It's about a way to look at populations, ethnicity, cultures, age, disabilities, sexual orientation, all those sorts of things. But competency refers to the ability to understand and respond effectively to diversity. So we're talking about cultural competence. As a teacher, your job is to be culturally competent, as it is to be competent in writing, competent in speech, competent in the math course that you're going to teach, but you also have to be culturally competent because it crosses all those areas. And you have to teach the students to be. Take a five minute break, please. Only five minutes, because I'm not with you a long time today. Is this item that you need to be paying attention to is something that you'll always 
hopefully have in your mind. But this is one of the biggest items that I think we need to be talking about in our school systems. Who can still tell me one of the lingering elements or one of the biggest issues in our school systems? The gap. It is, right? The gap is still there. Your goal is to close the gap, but in a very interesting way. You can close the gap by helping those who are at the top not do so well, right? That's not the way you want to close it. Your gap should be to the goal or to the highest level possible, but bringing everybody up to that. We still have some issues in our schools that are fairly large. And we can blame the parents if we want to. If that helps you to feel better about your crappy job, that's okay. But my argument is you do all that you can do and make your job just great. Teachers are the most powerful, in my mind, some of the most powerful people in the world. Think about your kids. Would you like for your kids to have a bad teacher or a good teacher? And I bet when your kids go to school, will you not concentrate on how good that teacher is? If we still have persistent gaps, we've got to talk about that because it's not just about the kids who are at the bottom. It's also about if you're not getting those kids, then you have to wonder how are you getting those other kids at the top, right? Did they get there because of you? Or did they get there in spite of you? And I'm being a little crude in my conversation with you on this, just simply because I want you to leave just knowing your power, just knowing what you can do to affect change in the school systems that are positive. And we've grown, we've done a lot of good stuff in Kentucky, and I'm very proud. I'm proud that EKU is working with our K-12 system. I'm proud of the other schools in the state that's working with our K-12 systems as partners to actually focus on this. But you can't do it superficially. You've got to figure out how to do it deeply with your pedagogy, with your curriculum, and with the way that you're engaging the students in the classroom. Staircase to cultural competence. Once again, we're not going to get close to getting through the PowerPoint, but I'm giving you this just as a tool anyway. I want you to look at this. The argument of this is that where you want everybody to be, your students and at least yourself at the base, would be that they're sensitive to the cultures that surround them and know how to take advantage of that to increase learning. But I want you to look at this. Where do you think most people are falling in America? Just think about the college students you're with. Where are most people on this line? You can tell one's going down, one's going up, right? Where are most people in America? What, where are most people that are your colleagues or your cohorts here in college? Where are they at? Excuse me? Where are they on this line? How many would argue that they're in one of these three spots? How many would say most of them are above this line here? Couple of you? We found out in America most people were below that spot, even some educated folks. What that's saying, two things. One is that they're basic thinkers. Basic thinkers are people that don't think deeply about stuff. So it's just as easy to stereotype people, to have prejudices toward folks without finding out knowledge, right? Your goal is to make sure your students walk out not with those attitudes. Your goals are to make sure that you don't have those. Where are you at? On, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but truly, where are you at on this line? Do you think, do you take advantage of the knowledge that's around you, even from different people? Or do you find yourself encircled in the people that you are with and can look at other people's hands length and make fun of them? Or say that they're not as good as I am? An important piece of this is not just about diversity. It's about the way we think. We know that critical thinking and higher order thinking is the baseline of good knowledge. Did you know that? 
being able to evaluate what's around you, evaluate knowledge, and come up with a conclusion. That's critical thinking. So this is a critical thinking chart. It's not just a diversity chart. So your goal is to get at this baseline. We should have done it if we'd done it right in college. We should have helped you to get at this baseline in your freshman year. This cultural sensitivity baseline and built on it from that point on. That's what we should have done. If we didn't do that, then I think we didn't do a good job. But we have to increase this knowledge base to help people to think critically about the folks that are around them and the world that they're living in. Then you move up. We talked a little bit about that. Where do you think I am on this ladder? See if you figured out anything yet. Who would take a guess? I'm going up. Let me, let me ask you to think about it this way. This doesn't mean that you are, never have a biased thought. This doesn't mean that you're not prejudiced sometimes. I'm that sometimes. I'm, I'm all of the, I'm not all, I don't kill people yet, uh, you know, uh, nor do I discriminate against folks. But every once in a while I fall and I stereotype. Every once in a while I have bias. Every once in a while I'm, I even prejudge someone. But most of the time, I'm up here, and that's where you have to look at it. Where do you spend most of your time, right? What's your baseline thought process? I am clearly somewhere around cultural action, cultural acceptance. Cultural competence means that everything you do all the time, and everything that you do, you stay there. Some, this is not putting down religion. I'm actually a fairly religious guy, which means that sometimes it's hard for me to be culturally competent. In other words, sometimes when you get caught up in your own religion, you forget the value of others and other religions kind of thing. So not all the time. I'm not, to me, that's utopia. But our goal is, and what teachers should do to themselves and to students, is to help them to try to get to that point. You understand what I mean? But you have to have the baseline in order to do that. You can't be down here all the time and do that with your students. So your first job is to self-assess and at least get to that strong base. And I'll let you read all those things. Sometimes this is the way we approach people, right? He said, yeah, I'll, I'll accept who you are. I want to accept all your value systems and everything that you, by the way, accepting someone's value system doesn't mean that makes it your value system, right? Doesn't mean that. That's where people say, well, I can't accept that. That just goes against my religion. Your religion has nothing to do with that. Your religion may say, you can't do that or you can't believe in that. That may not be you, but that doesn't mean that they are devalued because they do. Correct? But sometimes we approach people in such a way to say, my job is to change you, to make you like me. Let me see if I got, I don't know if, do I have the assessment here? I may not have. You don't have it in your packet, do you? That's okay. We don't have time to do it anyway. But I'll send it to I'll send it to you and give it to him later on. I want you to take this cultural competence assessment that I put together. It's really interesting. It gives you a really good baseline to kind of tell you where you're at. What can teachers do to promote diversity? Spend the next little time on this. Then I'm going to save about five minutes for questions, so if you don't have questions, I keep you 15 minutes longer, right? No. <laughs> Need to set aside class time for students to work together and learn about each other. Make that as a part of what you do. And they will learn from each other. Did you know the one, number one thing that students had in common that failed a course 
or that failed to produce high elements in a class, you know the one thing they had in common? They studied alone. How many of you knew that? That when students study alone, they do worse. And when they study together, they do a lot better. We are pack animals, folks. Studying together doesn't mean that you're copying. As a matter of fact, if you can't figure out a way to make that happen, something's wrong. Put them together. Use other individuals as resources during your class that students can connect with. Have guest speakers on a regular basis and make sure they're coming from diverse backgrounds. Let people just see what's going on. Yes? You don't, have to, you don't have to say, I'm doing diversity now. No. <laughs> Good learning means that you set up scenarios, situations where people learn from it and it goes deeper. Right? You, I, your belief system changes not because you say, I'm changing my belief system, I'm changing my belief system. It changes when you give them situations that allow it to change. Does that make sense? Yeah. You set the situation up, it will happen. You build it, they will come. Kind of thing. Yeah. Good question, though, by the way. Never tolerate disrespect. One of the things I will tell you is that in my classes, I love discussion. I love great academic debate. I think it's some of the most powerful things that we can do in a classroom is to have people show their thought process. I don't like people to disagree just because they can disagree. If you disagree with me, I promise you, you better bring something to the table because on any given day, I'll eat you up. The point is that you should be able to disagree with knowledge. Doesn't mean you have to have all knowledge all the time, but you learn from it. That's good learning. And what you want students to do, though, is to not disrespect someone in the process of that, though. And that's the ground rules you set as a teacher in your classroom. We, re we respect everybody, including the teacher. And you lay it out. And so you lay out a situation where they can learn, right? And not just to put yourself in a situation where you have to kind of control the crowd. So never tolerate disrespect, the number one thing that I don't do in my class. <laughs> you lay out ground rules to talk about what are the expectations of class cheating and a variety of other things. So in the group work, you allow individual inputs, but you don't actually allow someone to do all the work, right? Allow students to share personal histories. We all like talking about ourselves, whether we know that or not. We do. But we like to be in a situation where we're comfortable enough to do it. That's why we share a lot about ourselves with people that we trust. Classroom should be a trusting atmosphere. Have students bring an artifact from their cultural background and describe it. Not just bring your favorite pajamas to class today. I see teachers doing this all the time. Oh God, they have to bring something tomorrow, I don't know. Uh, everybody wear their favorite pajamas. While a waste. There's some things you can do. Say, bring something to class that, talk to your family, bring something to class that's really important to you, no matter what it is, and have them talk about it. All right? Give extra credit assignment for students to engage in, engage in co-curricular activities. I love this stuff. Have kids in their communities or whatever, if they go to a dance studio for a recital, give them extra credit if they talk about what they learned from them, the different things that they saw. This is about getting them to think about differences. You understand what I mean? That's some of the greatest learning. But you don't give them extra credit just to go to them. Doesn't make sense. They go to them and then they reflect on it and talk to you about it, either verbally or in written form. Research has found that certain principles of student learning should be considered in diversity education. These include the need for teachers to provide equality and access to learning, opportunities for students to participate in activities both inside and outside the classroom, 
and so on and so on and so on. We found out that this cuts down on bias tremendously when this happens. There is, I want to make this statement clearly, there are some things that are never acceptable. Incorrect English or standard English. And also the ability to verbalize yourself in a way that gets you to where you need to go. That doesn't mean you have to put some, down someone else for having what they're bringing to the table based on their culture. You know how to cherish that while at the same time you teach them other things. I was 10 years in business. Dr. Doris Wilkinson, who was one of my sociology professors, I thought I was a fairly good writer. Boy, she taught me that I wasn't. She worked with me, but she never made me feel as if I wasn't good at what I was doing or I wasn't, that I was dumb. But she taught me. And this fall is my 10th book coming out. Isn't that cool? I want you all to buy it because I got children to support. Why are you laughing? I do have children. Minority students in our population are facing obstacles to the educational system that lead to an achievement gap between them and their white peers. If you look at it closely, and there's some new data I should have shared with you. I just I have it. I just haven't put it in the PowerPoint. Nate, 13% of black and 19% of Hispanic fourth graders were at or above proficiency in math, while 47% of whites were. If you throw poverty into the equation, look what happens. It grows wider. We also know this. We also know that the top 10% of high performing poor students in the fourth grade equal to the top 10% of high performing upper class students, upper socioeconomic class students. They're about even when they get to the eighth grade the poor kids, even though they're academically the same in the fourth grade, dropped substantially by the time it gets to the eighth grade. What happens? They can do it. You can't blame the families there that they didn't support the educational process. Something happens in transitioning from middle, I mean, elementary school to middle school to high school. We're losing our poor kids faster. We're losing our minority kids faster. National Assessment of Education Progress also reported that 88% of black, 86% of Hispanic, and 81% of American Indian Alaska Native eighth graders read below grade level compared to 62% of white students. Don't get me wrong, we are losing some of our white students. We're losing men so fast, white and black, we got to do something about it. I want you to look around this room right now and tell me some observations that you see. Look around, tell me. Do I? Lots of ladies. There's actually more men in this group than I've seen in a long time, so good job, EKU. All the men, most of the men are losers except for you. They're sitting on the back row. You're not. No, I'm joking. Yeah, we're losing men. We got to, but there are more men coming into the teaching profession. We need to get them more in an elementary school. But we look at Eastern Kentucky as an example. Throughout Kentucky, you know, the dropout rates are higher among boys. We've got to figure out how to not lose them, so that's another goal that we have. Research has shown that motivation is the key. We talked about that a little bit ago. How you treat the way a student replies to you in class is a key element of the success of that student. You heard the idea that no question is a bad question. That's partially true. But you should also take the opportunity to recognize that that student brought a question to the table while at the same time 
maybe help him or her without them knowing it, how to actually phrase the question into a great question. Take the opportunity to teach at that time without making them feel negated. Motivation to learn. The cultural diversity background of each individual, which includes race, ethnicity, and so on, is an opportunity, in some cases, to really learn. But we got to perceive it as an opportunity, not a lack of opportunity. <coughs> Research has clearly indicated that high quality teachers have more impact on a student's educational process and academic success than any other factor. Don't you just love this? Research has demonstrated that students with effective teachers three years in a row improve at almost three times the rate of students who had ineffective teachers. We've got to keep up with today's time. Technology matters, but that's no reason to make it not a learning experience. Technology should be a co-partner in our educational endeavor and not the sole partner, right? How do you balance culture? You've got to be able, no matter what background you come from, is to be multicultural in your delivery. You understand? People say, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a white teacher. I can't teach black kids. I don't know anything about their culture. That's like saying that since you were better in science than you were in math, that you don't have the ability to be taught how to teach math. It's the same process. It's human beings. We speak even the same language in most cases. But those that don't speak our language, the language of learning is a uniform language, right? How do we make ourselves into that multicultural teacher? Senate Bill 1 calls on us to increase the rigor and increase the output of our students. This is a tough one, but it's happening. Kentucky, as I said earlier, is on the forefront of this, but we've got to be able to make sure that when a kid leaves our classroom that they're at grade level and they are at common core standards level. <coughs> So what are the items that we need to look at to help them to be successful? Give me the definition of success, someone. Impress me. What's the definition of success? Over in the corner, talk to me. You guys are so far away, but I'm loving you. What's the definition of success? How many of you want to be successful? What's the definition of success? You raise your hand. You have to know what it means in order to get it, right? It is. But success is actually setting a goal and achieving it, right? That's what success is. But that doesn't explain it all, right? That's the quantitative summative element of success, but there's a qualitative formative element. It's called excellence. Excellence are the inputs. It's how you get to that goal is how you deliver it. And every bit of what you do matters. And it matters at a deep level. That's the way you define success, too. You may set a goal for yourself and fail miserably, but as I tell my kids, it's how hard you try and how much effort you put into achieving it. That's real success. Because not everybody can be the athlete that I am, as an example. Thanks for laughing, man. Appreciate it. I barely can walk. Yeah. Four things you need to understand to help students reach their own success is active involvement. How do you get them actively involved in school? Kids tell us all the time the reason why they dropped out or don't do well is because they're not engaged. That's the number one thing they tell us. Did you know that? 
and that students and teachers don't care. So how do you get them actively involved? That's one of your goals. This should be in your action plan. How do you help them to utilize the resources that's around them? And that's other people in the classroom, as well as the teachers, as well as the library, as well as the internet, as well as any of those things you do. How well are you doing to help them to utilize the resources that they need? The fourth thing is social interaction and collaboration. How do you build teams so they can depend on each other and support one another? How do you build peer teams in order to, for them to actually get where they need to go and know they got somebody on their team that they can count on, that they trust? And the last one, self-reflection. How do you teach them to recognize when they don't have what they need? When they get home and you're not with them and you give them homework, how can you keep them motivated enough to understand that it's important for the homework to take place? If it's going to be homework, make it important homework. Don't give them homework where they can all do it in class and say, oh, God, I gave them homework what they did in the class. Homework should be homework. And it should be an added piece that's going to help them get where they need to go. Don't just give them frivolous homework, just say you did. Or don't just give them homework where they get the 20 questions of math wrong that they bring back to you and you got another worksheet you have to give them the next night. That's crazy. Homework should be reflected on, looked at, talked about, delivered, discussed, and they should walk out with every piece of homework, no matter who that kid is, should walk out knowing sooner or later they know how to do it correctly. <coughs> you need to talk about the personal stuff. In other words, you need to challenge them to have skin in the game, I call it. That they need to know that they are a part of their learning process. If you leave EKU and say, well, yeah, man, I just didn't do very well in school because they just didn't teach me enough, well, it's okay to blame EKU for that, but it's your fault, too, right? Have your kids know that it's their piece that they need to be involved in, so a part of your teaching should be helping them understand how to have skin in the game, right? How many of you feel that way? How many of you know you need to just get up and work out, but you got to stay in that bed that extra 10 minutes longer? You know what I mean? How many of you know that you, after that ice cream that you ate that you shouldn't have eaten, and let me tell you, that orange leaf yogurt is really good, but you eat three pounds of it, I promise you it still puts weight on. But it's still so good. I love learning that way, I promise you. I love learning so much that I feel so privileged to be able to be there in the midst. I can start talking to people and I really will go down a path when I know I need to do something else, but I just can't let it go because it's that orange leaf yogurt I'm eating. Yes, sir. I have a feeling you have a lot of disagreements with me, man. Okay. Well, let me clarify if you heard me say that. That's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say is that EKU alone isn't the fault. You have to have skin in the game, too. EKU is partially the fault, if that's the case. But you, as an adult, as a person to learn, a part of you didn't get the learning was if you know you didn't get it, and if you know that you didn't get it, is to search out and try to get it. So it's a combination. It's a co-facilitation of learning. You can't just take the individual out of the puzzle. It's great to put it all on the institution, and I surely believe we should bear the brunt. So I'm not disagreeing with that. But I'm saying, as a teacher, you need to help students to understand how to recognize when they're not learning, because you may, and, and ask, then ask the teachers and other people to help them to learn. And it's more than just being forced to go to school, or a public school or whatever. It's the idea that it's an opportunity for learning no matter where you're at, and my argument is that teachers need to help kids know that they are a part of the learning process. 
that they're not just sitting idly by waiting for information to kind of flow in and hopefully they'll get it. They need to know how to ask questions. They need to know how to recognize when they didn't get something. And they need to feel free. And your job as a teacher, in my mind, is to help them to feel free to come to you when they don't have it and you respond to it. Just like at EKU, as a student, if you're not getting, you know you're not getting, no matter even if you got an A on the test, your job isn't to say, I got an A on the test, so it's time for me to move on. Your job is to say, yeah, I got an A on the test, but I ain't understanding that debt blame thing you told me. That's the country term, by the way. So that's what I'm arguing. So it, you just can't, sooner or later we got to quit pointing fingers is my argument. There's four elements that I use in order for me to be successful that I look at it clearly. One is that my family, the importance of that, they had no education, but they pushed hard on me having what they didn't have. Huge element. I could talk about this for like three hours. The second one is the community. Understanding the people that were involved in my community, the churches, the banks, the, the peers that I hung out with, they were an essential part. They could hold me back or they could help me up. The peers, the mentoring. The third one was the institutions I went to, the school system, as an example. You know, the things that they taught me, the curriculum, the pedagogy, the teachers, all of those things mattered tremendously. And in this case, you found out it may matter more. But the fourth one, in which no one ever considers, is the person, him or herself. My brothers and sisters don't have a lot of education, but I promise you, my parents told us all the same thing. I just heard something differently. You understand what I mean? So you can never discount the individual in the learning process. So it's our job is to build their capacity to get it. And then it's our job to give it to them and make sure they got it. Right? Class participation matters. You know what I've talked about that already. It establishes a strong human being and one that's ready for learning. Most of this I go through and talk to you a little bit about what you need to do to set up your own individual process, monitoring, what you can do with the kids outside of class. <laughs> I thought that was cute. There's real learning and there's fake learning, right? <laughs> Let me kind of lead this with the way you can use resources in your school, then I'm going to take questions from you. Student to faculty interaction is one of the is the number one thing to help a student to be successful in school that we talked about and that's student to faculty interaction inside and outside the classroom it's the way we do our business inside the classroom but outside the classroom when I see you what's your name Drew Drew I'm walking up and down the hall and I find a little bit of, you don't even know I know this about you whatever it is tell me something about you so I can pretend I know it okay I'm walking outside the classroom and I say, hey Drew, what's going on? What's the latest video game that's out there today? Having a teacher call on a student by name outside that classroom setting in a very friendly way increases the likelihood that that student's going to be engaged in an in-classroom and be not a behavioral problem. How many of you knew that? Think about it for a second. It just takes a little stuff. So getting students engaged in the classroom and outside the classroom is a huge piece. Student interaction with the guidance counselors. We have our guidance counselors doing way too many things now. So when I'm saying guidance counselors, it may not be officially a person that's in a guidance counselor road, but it's someone that wants to talk to you about what they believe in their future and what's going on with their life. So teachers, if you know your guidance counselor is not engaging, you have to be the mentor. You understand what I mean? You have to be the mentor of the student. Find the student and mentor the heck out of that student. Student interaction with a mentor. It can be a peer mentor or a faculty mentor or a professional mentor or whatever. 
It's an important piece. And student student interaction. If a student is afraid or being bullied, we know the effects that that has on a student. We should never put up with it. But also, a student can learn a whole lot from another student. How do we officially set that up? That's my summation, and I'm going to take questions for the next five minutes. And if you don't talk to me, I'm going to preach for the next half hour. Oh, absolutely. You know, this is the excellent question. What I will tell you is know the culture of your eighth grade class. No eighth graders. If you know eighth graders, I, I deal with eighth graders all the time. I can get them all engaged. I just have to go where they're at. And you have to set up decorum, no doubt about it. But you have to go where they're at and talking about the things that they know what they're talking about, using the examples of where they're coming from and making them believe what you have to tell them is something about them. Eighth graders, as you all know, is going through that magical time. We all know what that is. We, we know that they know more than anyone else on earth, right? So how do we take advantage of that transition to adulthood as a way to learn? That's the way you get students engaged, is to go kind of where they're at, but teach them the things you know. It's not going where they're at and doing all the things they do. It's going where they're at, teaching them the things that they need to do. But it can't happen. I'm not saying it's not harder for some groups. The reason why I decided to be a college professor is because I knew I would be crappy as a high school teacher, as an example. But part of it is, it's knowing how to get them engaged where they're going. But that matters. And you will capture more of them. By the way, let me say this. You will not capture everybody all the time. But your job is to try to capture everybody all the time. Right? Other questions? You're going to have to give me more than one. Yes. When you talk about the student-to-student -student interaction and like the diversity aspect of it, do you do groups? Would that be like an example? Of that? You can do groups to do partnerships and purposefully use diversity as a way to put them together. Once again, it doesn't always have to be on different ethnicities or different races, but you know different belief systems and give them an assignment and give them specific tasks to do in that assignment. They'll have to work together. Your job is to create a situation where they learn from each other and work together at a deeper level. And they'll be engaged, too. Does that make sense? So you can use diversity as a mechanism of doing that. Make sense? And you make it a part of the formal assignments. They don't have to know that's what you're doing. You don't tell them, guess what, guys? You guys are different, so I'm going to put you together. That's not what you do. Yeah. Other questions? I got time for like 15 more. Seriously, I got time for one more good one. What is it? Give me a strong one. Impress me. Clay County, you got to ask me. I want to tell your mama and your, I mean your grandma and your daddy that you talked to me. I remember when her father was born. Shows you how old I am. One more question. I'm not letting you go until you give it to me. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely, but tell them what the HALO method is. That's right, but add a little more to that HALO effect. What else would you add to that? Don't just do it based on ability. Throw other skills, other cultural elements to it. That's right. That's exactly what you do, but you make sure that you're intentional, that you give them a way that one person is not concentrating on just their one strength, right? Guys, you have been wonderful. Let me tell you. I am so proud to see this group. I'm so proud to see you folks going to be teachers. You are the future of this state and of America, and I appreciate you at levels I can't tell you. I'd rather see a good teacher. My daughter became a teacher. I'd rather see a good teacher any day than see a great engineer. 
except if I have to cross the bridge that the teacher built. <laughs> but that's not the point. Thank you all for doing this. Thank you for being a part of it. It's been my pleasure being with you. I just have a few announcements.